Good day, everyone. Good day. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. Your mental health depends on it. I am Cecilia Salazar, and thank you so much for joining us today. And happy Valentine's Day, Dean Vonnett. Happy Valentine's Day. To you, too. And everyone out there, thank you for joining yes, us. Yes, yes, yes. May lots of peace, joy, and happiness find you today and every day. Dean Bisundial here, everyone, and we truly appreciate you connecting with us today. And we have a very interesting show planned. Hi, guys, Juan and Bigfoot. Happy Valentine. And welcome to those of you who are connecting with us online and who are watching us on television. I hope you are ready to engage and to share your comments and feedback um, with us on today's show. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So Speak Your Mind is a weekly discussion on mental health issues to start breaking the stigmas associated with it and, and help you see some solutions and cultivate some better mental health practices. Yes. According to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. And good mental health doesn't always mean that you feel happy and that you don't have bad moods or bad days. Right. But if anxiety, low mood, or other symptoms of your mental health condition are overwhelming or difficult to cope with, then it is likely that you don't have current, currently good mental health. Right. Wow. So having good mental health is about feeling positive about ourselves and others being able to form good relationships and and having the resilience to overcome challenges yeah and in today's show we're continuing our discussion on youth and in particular their attraction to badness and crime oh boy have you noticed that teenage boys do ever like to smile when they take pictures have you all noticed that yes they yeah. say it's because they think it, it makes them look soft when this Oh, yeah, boy. So many natural behaviors are, have been um, are being eroded because oh, you just want to look grimy. You know, they want bad man thing. That is why today we are talking about our youth and their attraction to badness and crime. What is this really doing to our young men and women? Mm -hmm. Well, to guide us through our discussion today is our good friend, forensic psychologist, Swain Leo Hussein Kadoga. And we, uh, we also have Sherman Braffett, Marvin Mar Sal has Yes? Sal, we missed you there for a bit. You didn't hear me. We no. have Sherman Braffett and Marvin Mohammed with us. They are both registered mental nurses. And joining us today as well is psychiatric nurse, Anthony Von Gunness. Hear the name, Anthony Von Gunness. <laughs> Let's connect with these gentlemen now and start the conversation.
Okay, good day, good day, all, Leo. Glad to have you with us again. Welcome, Marvin, Sherman, and Anthony. Thank you for taking the time to share your experiences with us today. Yeah. Uh oh, we didn't hear Leo. Oh, we have a little we audio. Are. Sorry right, about there that. We go. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. I am Swain Leo. I'll spare you the rest of the name. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, all. Shimon Braffett here. Thank you for having me once again. All right, hey, Shimon. Hi. And Michael? Marvin. 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 Sorry. Hi, good day. Mark and I can make it today, so. All right. We are here. <laughs> And and hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Anthony Von Ganis. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be who, here this afternoon. To those of you who have joined us online, please share the show on our timelines. We look forward to your thoughts, your comments, and questions to our expert panelists. And we want you to share it because we really think that this is a program that a lot more people need to have access to. So keep sharing it so that people, more people get in on yeah. the action. Yeah. Right, so let's get into it. Gentlemen, you deal with our, you deal with youth in crisis. Mm -hmm. What are the effects of our violent society on young men and women? Mm -hmm. What are you seeing happening to them when they, by the time they reach your facilities? Uh, Marvin, you want to start this one, please? Okay, so what we see happening is the youth come in aggressive, violent, they take, they want to be in charge. They want to run the facility. And wow. you can't tell them nothing. They, 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 they're telling you they will meet you outside. We are people who go run up in here. We go kill you. We go kill your family. We are links. We can find where you're living. It's all kind of threats. It's everything coming. And that's what we're getting coming into the system. Unfortunately, there are just a few that come in into the system. What about all the ones that are not coming into the system and have that same mentality? Yeah. And the yeah. product we see of that is, for the last few years, we have seen so much under, children under the age of 18 dying. Where before you hardly had children getting murdered, now it's becoming a common thing. A lot of children are being murdered. And this is a sad state of affairs. And this is something that we need to get our hands dirty and we'll come and try and save the youths tomorrow because the way it's going, we really won't have much. So you're talking about younger and younger children um, dying and, and being violent. Do you think it's, it's because of video games, movies, social media, the news headlines? I mean, it's just, it's just packed with violence everywhere our children turn. Is this constant exposure to violence? What is this doing to our children? Well, um, I agree. It has many different things. One of the things is that we have a lot of community leaders or gang leaders, as we call them, Aye. that a lot of children look up to. So we see them driving a the nice car, wearing the big gold chain. Mm -hmm. He had the, the girls around him, and he also had the money to go with it. Plus, most important, he had the fame. Everybody knew him. Everybody wanted to be a friend. Everybody wanted to be around him. And at some point, some of the youths, they want to feel like that. They want to feel like they have this power. They have this level of respect. And the only way you can get it is through being bad. It also have other reasons why sometimes it have poverty. Some of them don't until when the day come. It also mm -hmm. the music. If you remember some years back where we had at the schools, it was Gaza versus Kali. That was vibes cartel and more two Jamaican singers influencing our school in Trinidad to war one another. Where it was so bad, it had to make news and police had to intervene. We also had some years back the G Unit School when a singer by the name of Fifth Distance came out. They was doing a lot of havoc when they when Fifth Distance had no combat. You can't go in yeah. town, they was robbing you for fun, if you remember. All right? Mm -hmm. So music plays a big part. Yeah. Um, I remember our Prime Minister, this is Mr. Patrick Manning, he had an idea to ban all these type of music. When I was younger that time, I disagree with him and I was like, nah, he can't do that. You take every yeah. right, yada, yada. 15 years down the line from that idea when he had the 2020 vision, is like, I was, was onto something mm -hmm. because I see where the music is affecting a lot of the youths. Uh, Brother, do you remember when we did a school, a talk in a school in um, Port of Spain area? 
and we played no profit Ganes, and we played the music and we had four young four young men and we was playing the music and had the chain and the champagne and all the chairs and down by the oh god let me bosses watch them and um, right after that we put up pictures of two of the gang members there they were shot up bullet holes all over and the place got quiet it got extremely quiet the children recognized that wait at that point in time this thing's serious but before that they was real happy and they embrace the level of youngster the level of big gold chain they, they embrace it and i mm -hmm. think this is a problem so we need to show them the results and i think sometimes we shy away from this we shy away from showing children what the outcome could be because we try to shelter them but the reality is the bad side already working and they're showing them what it have to offer them However, we need to show them what the bad side also offers from a good point of view. Because I get the same that young leaders get a area. And I'm a psychiatric right. nurse. Marvin, if, Children if I may, Marvin. The same way. Yes. Jump right. in. Cecilia? Yeah. Now, the thing is, we, we need to remember that our youth are looking for examples. Right. And it's a case of examples towards success. Now, all of us, in all of our bringing, we had some simple principles to follow. We go to school mm -hmm. to get a decent job, to have a decent life, so we could afford the decent things in life. That mm -hmm. has been the universal teaching principle ever since. Um, you guys are in the arts, and that, that channel things a little bit differently, but all the same, it is essentially for you to be able to afford the things mm -hmm. that life would have to offer. Right. Gang leaders are able to do that, afford the things that life has to offer. It's just that their True. means are exceptionally different mm -hmm. and quicker that's the thing and quicker so that's the thing and yes. quicker that's money. so youth yeah. are seeing youth are seeing a fast forward a fast track a quick channel towards the things that they need to get in life what they're not seeing is the the down the road consequences where we don't have a gang leader living past 45. they don't see right. that and they, they see the glamour and if I and if I may um, chip in on that, and I'm glad Showin Showin took it down that road as well because I wanted a link from Marvin as well. That and that same very same day, one of the very sobering things that happened that gave us probably 100% attention for the entire rest of the session that we did with those youth men was when we put up a pit here with a particular gang leader who was deceased holding his little daughter, and we and we made a comparison with Marvin. We put posted a picture for them on the multimedia with Marvin and his little daughter. And then we showed them another picture with Marvin and his daughter at her current age. And we, yeah. and, we, and, we and we informed them that the gang leader, because of the choice that he made, will never get to take a picture like that with his daughter mm -hmm. because he's now deceased. And that was a very sobering moment in terms of, yes, you know, yes. where, where does it end? And what is That's the future it. that you look, that you are looking for? And, um, on that note, we find a lot of youths trying to access the easier way out and the easier way to fame. You know, and that, that underscores the importance of the work that we are set about to do. I think it's the very foundational principle that has myself and my three other colleagues here on the same platform today, where we see the need for reaching out in a positive way as males mm -hmm. to influence our youths and to touch our youths and to at least say, you know what, we're not going to just allow the gang leaders Mm -hmm. and the negative influencers in our society to, to take our youth you know what we have we are we are walking a positive path and we want to share our stories we want to share our, our experiences our challenges and we want to let the youths know that you know the part that we have chosen we have no regrets about it as well mm -hmm. yeah. one of the things that that is very important um in closing is as well and that score is that you know a lot of our youths as marvin would have mentioned go through a lot of different um life experiences and based on their life experiences some of them have it easy and they just want to experience it all day and some of them come out of abject poverty their community influences as the case may be and then we want to find out exactly and we're asking the question as a matter of fact why do they behave like this why are their re responses towards society so violent and one of the thing about it is that um the body and the mind has a way where it acts out uh, uh, um, the, the series of uh, some of the experiences and the exposure that they would have had in life. And that when the music and, uh, and the negative influences yes. and everything ties together and builds the True. personality. 
that now we have a young man who is acting based on what he would have been exposed to that built his personality on that note in my last statement uh, the, the science holds it that the, that the, the the brain is not fully developed until the age of 25 which oh, means yes. that up until the age of 25 there, there is a lot of room for, for 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 shaping and building the personality into either a positive one or a negative one and, and, and what the brain is exposed to will depend on how it develops into a healthy or mm. an unhealthy adult for society. Mm. All right. mm. Thanks for taking it down that road, Ganis. Let me let me add to that. In addition to the brain not being developed, the pleasure center of the brain is right. fully matured from the age of 15. But the rest of the frontal lobe, that controls our decision making that does not mature until about 25 to 30 as Ghana said so you have individuals who every time they do something and it gives them what they want the pleasure reward center is is activated right, right. so if being bad gets me what i want if i don't have to wait for it if i can get it now instant gratification as we True. say yes. they'll repeat that much more often right mm -hmm. that makes so much and, sense yep yep and just true. one thing i want to add one thing I want to add is that we grew up in a society where to do any wrong thing is the right thing. So what I mean by that is, as a youth, <laughs> if you do have a gun in certain areas, you do any wrong thing. Oh, you mean you yeah. don't have a gun? Or wrong with and you. this is the reality. So I agree with Mr. Kodogan in saying that, trust me, a lot of them is pleasure. A lot of them like the vibes. And a lot of them also, when you talk about the we did the age at 25 and make a proper decision. The decision of the 25 years and 30 years in the area is that badness is the right way. Mm. So when the adults make the decision that the badness is the right way, we have the youths at 14, 15, 16, 17 thinking, it's okay to beat a woman. I mean, you never beat a woman. Oh, you mean you never shoot nobody? Or what kind of lifestyle you live in? Something wrong with you? Now, nah, man, you can't be from this area to represent we. And this is the wow. problem that some of the youths are going through. And there's a lot of peer pressure. There's a lot. They're going through a lot. It's a hard battle. Just wanted to add in that point that sometimes the wrong thing is the right thing. Yeah, to them. Yeah. But, to them but you know, there's also, there's also such a fear among teenage boys and young men of appearing too emotional or caring that it forces them into isolation and not being able to make strong, meaningful bonds with other boys. In fact, we have a video done by Niobe Wee on an NBC report on how that leads to toxic ma masculinity. Let's take a listen. When you begin to interview them at 12 or 13, they tell you about a lot of love that they have for their friendships. They talk about wanting that kind of intimacy with other boys. I think friends are the things that kept me composed in the hardest times that I had. As boys got older, they began to tell a very different story. They'll say things like, uh, no homo, in response to a question about intimate friendships. That question to them has now become a gay question, rather than a question about just their friendships, which is how they heard it when they were 13 or 14. No homo was used a lot among my straight friends. Because of we don't want to seem as if we're being uh, gay towards each other or saying gay terms. That reveals the culture because the fact they're equating friendship with gayness is a part of American culture of masculinity. Somehow to be a boy, to be grow into a man, you have to be emotionless. There's a growing but silent epidemic affecting middle-aged adults that has debilitating mental and physical effects. And that's emotional isolation. And those effects are being felt by men most of all. According to some experts, the trend begins in junior high. I've been studying social emotional development for about almost 30 years. <laughs> Interviewing boys about their relationships, their friendships, um, the kinds of things that are important to them. As a developmentalist, I, I follow them over time. Middle adolescence, early middle adolescence, they tell you about a lot of love that they have for their friendships. They're very, very clear about their desire for emotionally intimate male friendships. A best friend for me is usually someone that I can talk to, be relaxed with, chill but i would also like a best friend to be communicative like we also have to tell each other and be honest with each other on what we think of ourselves or like any topic you know we had a very close relationship me and my friends we shared secrets with each other and talked very intimately intimately with one another i would say that yeah we loved each other yeah 
as boys got older, they began to tell a very different story. So they really articulate the, 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 um, the bizarre expectations we have of boys as they get older, that they should disconnect from their innate emotional acuity, their emotional sensitivity, uh, in order to become a man. When he was in high school, Professor Wei gave a guest lecture at Vinnie's school, and her findings matched exactly what Vinnie was experiencing with his friends. Not only did like our conversation start to change, we hung out and, and didn't really talk all that much. I spent a lot of time alone, or when I was with my friend, it still kind of felt like being alone. But there was a time where I was completely isolated. Mm. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's, it's it been is. happening for generations. This is the way that, that males have been socialized. The term man up. Sure. Yes. Sure. Don't cry. Don't man show up. emotion. You know? I remember at one point um, hearing in my youth somebody re uh, was telling their son, they're talking on the phone so much. He's like, yellow. What? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so as a man, you are supposed to say very little. Don't express any emotion. Mm -hmm. Keep that that stoic face at all times. And this is this is what we see. At four right. or five years old, yeah. you look at children play. They hold hands. They hug yeah. each other. They share True. everything. Say, no. See them ten years later, yeah. and everything is rough. Yeah. You show you show affection to your friend by hitting them. Yeah. Or calling them names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Calling them names fact, and things. We door. even socialize <laughs> women and females to accept this. The little girl is always told if the boy hit chains because he like you. Yeah. yeah. And that's the stage <laughs> that for is so, that is so true where, to be good love. Yeah. Yeah. In the Middle East, actually, they, they did some interviews with, with teenagers in the Middle East and amazingly. 15, 16 year old girls were saying, well, yeah, if, if their boyfriend doesn't slap them, hit them, embarrass them in public, he doesn't really love them. So it's, it's, it's everywhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Guys, what, what, what about gender based violence? We've seen a lot of gender based violence in our society today. Do you feel it's, it's linked to teaching our young men and women about building healthy relationships? So, and we're talking healthy relationships, we like to use that word, but what do we consider a healthy relationship, though? If, if you could jump in their lead, what do you consider a healthy relationship? That's a. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put you on the spot. Um, I did. Yeah, you put, me, you put me on the spot a little bit because our models of healthy relationship, if we think back to it, aren't all that healthy to begin healthy. with. Very I true. mean, if we look back at the older generation, you, you'll hear many people talk about, you know, they never really saw their parents or their grandparents fight because it's true. We don't fight in front of the children, but when we close the door, you hear furniture moving, a little scuffle going on, <laughs> <laughs> this sort of thing. And now we have it on TV where, I mean, I don't look at Lifetime Network. I mean, <laughs> that is just, yes, it's the reality that people face, but there, there aren't that many good examples of healthy relationships. Everything exactly. is dysfunctional. It's in prime time. It's all dysfunctional. And yeah. as I've said before, you know, we start early in that socialization. If the boy hits you, it's because he likes you. If he pull your hair or call your names, it's because he likes you. And then men also aren't socialized to talk about their feelings. Mm. So you have men being encouraged to, to physically express only one emotion, anger and frustration. Whereas women are always very vocal. So what tends to happen and unhappy, if somebody, if a woman is unhappy in a relationship and she begins to vocalize, the man now is unable to get a word in edgewise, can't communicate effectively, so he'll swing. Yeah. And that, that has been the norm. Now we're seeing where women are equally as quick to throw fists. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking no lash from no man. Yeah. I will give as good as I get. Yes. And that then starts a snowball effect mm -hmm. of violence upon violence. But yes statistically men are always seen to be the aggressors because as a man i can't go to the police station and say my my spouse beat me i will be laughed out of the police station in a heartbeat 
Yeah. Well, I. Yeah. Yeah. I I want I want um to chip in there and two on two on two fronts in that we have seen domestic mm -hmm. violence uh, and 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 gender based violence becoming so prominent in society that it has been enough to trigger the authorities to start to put things in place. Mm -hmm. Where we have seen a revamping of legislation, the setup of the gender based violence yes. unit of Units. the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. You know, the yes. stationing of gender-based violence officers across the country, which is people specifically trained to address issues like these. And, you know, it, so, so we are starting to respond because there's a problem. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the question that Vonnet was asking, I believe that a healthy relationship that, you know, in, in, in an ideal sense, um, is one where there is mutual respect, yes. where, where both, both partners in that relationship respect each other, even when there are differences, Mm -hmm. um among themselves in terms of their views and their opinions and it's also a space where 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 both parties can be very comfortable about the things that they share because it is it, it it's supposed to be built on a on a on a foundation of trust in each other that we share with each other we respect each other and you know we are doing this thing together in order to build it to build a healthy relationship however when here yeah, we throw that into the context of what we are seeing in reality you know, I think we are at the point where we need strong role models. Yeah. Um, possibly where we need to redefine our masculinity roles and to some and, and to an extent as well the roles of femininity, because that has changed so much in terms of the way how women are now being socialized. Um, I think there's a disconnect between our expectations of, mm -hmm. of the woman. Yes. Um, in terms of seeing them in their traditional values and, and not their professional values and, and, and their professional capabilities as now the working woman, the educated woman, and not the woman who is just a housewife um, to the man. And so our expectations need to be redefined. We need to, to, to look at our expectations in terms of how do we put out masculinity out there. And when we work that together, into a, a society that is responding, then we will start to really build um, healthy mm. relationships, a healthy society. Wow. Yeah. Can I please? Yes, of course. So, <laughs> so here's the challenge, right? Wow. We are asking ourselves to fix the wagon's wheel while it's rolling. <laughs> yes that's the challenge because mm -hmm. because we are all products of that dysfunctional yep. <laughs> um yes. mentorship that that happened with our parents mm -hmm. while at the same time we are trying to have our relationships and i'm saying as healthy as they can be and at the same time try to impart onto those below us our our youth what a healthy relationship should be so you're going to find a situation where we ourselves um fall short but in falling short we need to be adult enough we need to be model enough we need to be deliberate enough to say listen i have fallen short here this is not the best way forward a better way to go is this direction that's the challenge where we need to as, as anthony was saying we need to redefine our masculinity we need to redefine it in such a way that we allow our emotions to come forward as words, even as, as, as emotions expressed, not just violence, not just physically. Communication. Um, yes, communication needs to come up. It needs to come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we need to we need to be mm -hmm. able to get this all of this across to the youth. All of to this youth, that you're yeah. saying. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's a challenge. So the, the notion is not that relationships will not have problems and disagreements. It is mm -hmm. how we handle it. Yeah. And right. Being able to see a working model of how a disagreement can be handled by, as, as my, my learned colleague said, in ideal circumstances, well-adjusted adults. Yeah, boy. <laughs> um, I, I want to bring I'm, up another, yeah. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I was just saying, and one of the problems we have in with the masculinity is that the men egos is a problem. Oh. Is a problem. Because yeah. a yeah. man could have ten women and there's no problem. He good with that. But let us woman who has been faithful for him for the last twenty years step mm -hmm. outside once. He will have killed right. yeah. yeah. He would have killed <laughs> and I mean this is something we oh, don't oh, any of the any of the Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Any of the <laughs> <laughs> 
And this is something we have to look at in the youth. That this is what they're saying. If the woman who I met, beat she up. If she talked to her next boy, beat she up. This is what they're learning from the adults. And as Bradford say, we fix it while the wheel rolling. And we just stop the car, fix the tire, which is focus on the youth, as Ghana referred to. In terms of how to treat women. A simple yeah. thing as a secondary school, have the boys ask the girls to dance. Hi, good day. Could I have a dance with you? Could I bring this a social day? And and the mere practicing to treat women in this type of way mm -hmm. is I think yeah. would have a good effect in how we young boys treat men because we will be teaching them how to treat a woman as opposed to the same men with some big egos and brutalizing women. For no reason, and it yes. has some women who have some big egos, as well. So I mean, it's yeah. not just one way. Some women has bitter man. Mm, right. Of course, but I think that's a that's a wonderful idea you have there. That you all and and there are certain men out there who have to be the role models if their parents at home are not being those role models for them. And I love that idea of having a social and showing them, you know, how to be social, not yeah. toxic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I want to bring up another point quickly here. Because we are asking the question, why some children end up being violent while others in that same environment don't? That always um, confuses me. You know, we we have we have this other video here from Craig Pinky, Pinky, a criminologist in London, who attempts to give his take on why that is. And as a criminologist, part of my work is about trying to understand what causes young people to be violent, asking that most important question, why? Why would a young person that is 16, 15, 17 years old want to pick up a knife and just stab someone at random and they've never met them before? Why would someone want to pick up a gun just because someone lives in a completely different postcode and be prepared to shoot it? Why would someone be prepared to kill a child on a school bus just because they're looking at them for 10 seconds? And the fact of the matter is there's not one answer to answer why young people arrive at that particular point. There's actually a series of factors. Dysfunction of families, father absence, racism, poor identities, dysfunctional homes. But one thing that really sticks out for me when I'm analyzing this type of thing is this one word about invisibility, invisible. What I find in my work is that most young people in our society are invisible unseen, unheard. And if anybody knows the history of cultures and communities that when people feel oppressed, when people feel invisible, when people feel unheard, sometimes they do things in order to be visible. So we might not be able to understand why a young person gets on the bus one day and feels that in order to get credibility, I need to hurt somebody, I need to rob somebody's phone. Our young people are invisible. Wow. Mm. Wow. Interesting. I, very much I, too. Um, oh, very much too. Or you want me to? Uh, I'll start you. You pick up. So one of the things that Marvin would have mentioned before was this notion yeah. of, of power, status, prestige. Yeah. And that is one thing. Yes. Uh, any Anybody who sees me, anything I do that gets me notoriety is good. People will know my name. I want that 15 minutes, 15 seconds of fame. That's sure. on the one hand. Uh, when you do a lot of work with trauma, what you realize is many times this acting out behavior is a means of exacting some form of control. For individuals who not only feel powerless, but they have been victimized. They are victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, or, or just come from an area that is where they are always overlooked. Mm -hmm. Being able to be violent towards somebody, I can control who I will attack. I will control what is happening to you. And it gives them that sense of power. For once, I have control. I will not be powerless. I will not be invisible. You know, we made that statement, hurt people, hurt other people. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and that is one of the many examples of why we see so much violence among our youths. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. On that answer the yeah. On that note, um, and I wanna just tackle that question directly. Yeah. In that <laughs> what we see, uh where we say it, it begins at home sometimes. Because sibling rivalry 
is ah. something that is that is real. And two persons may grow up in the same home under the same moral direction and instructions and the same code um, from both parents. And yet still, they, they turn out to be different because they would have perceived mm. the entire home environment differently. So for wow. example, in some homes, yeah, I mean, parents do some very little things, for example, like if you, you, you favor one child over the other and mm -hmm. the child that is not being favored could find himself wanting to prove himself to him parents mm -hmm. or could find himself saying that you know what i am i am being while that might be one reaction i want to prove myself another can be that you know i am not being heard or seen so i'm going to withdraw from this home and i'm going to pick up some company at the outside where i'm heard or seen and that's where i i, I find myself falling into the gang culture mm -hmm. where i am yeah. welcomed is where is where i will go and mm -hmm. both of us find ourselves growing up in the very same home but then we perceive things very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on that note, because of uh, differences and variations in how we perceive what is what the home environment is like and how we interpret it, we may make different choices. Because if I see the home as, as something that is a place that is welcoming, that is warm, that that, that builds me, that that you know that a place of trust, a place where mm -hmm. I uh, as a young person I can express myself freely without the repercussions, I can be heard, I will stay in that environment. And, if, and likewise, if I, if I feel that, that that environment is not suitable for me, and we know in the teenage years, teenager, teenagers can be quite, um, give a quite a push for independence. I want to do my own thing. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the rules and, and, and the code of the home is not healthy. It maybe might as well be very healthy, but you know what? I want to go out there because I want to show that I'm independent. I want to go out there because you know I, I think that I can make my own decisions. And they stray from the healthy home environment and go looking for it out there. And this where they find themselves in situation because you know what, it comes down to, I wanna use a key word here, the choice that they would have made. Mm -hmm. And then because of the choices that they would have made, and, and my last point here, because of the choices that they would have made, the choices the now puts them in position where some of them go through some pretty traumatic experiences. Some of them may, expe may in order to be induct in, inducted, in, um, inducted into a gang, they may, they may need to go through an initiation procedure, which is to either Have kill to somebody, to get in some form of a violence, to go and put down a robbery at a very young age because of the choice that they made. And then you find one brother who is, who is excellent academically, doing well, having everything going for him, and the other brother now who, who, who is on the bad man side. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, naturally as a parent, what you may find yourself doing, and we're not here to point fingers, is that you may find yourself now giving more attention and support to the child that may seem as a good child mm -hmm. and the one who really needs that more attention who is going down the bad road you leave him to go down the bad road and yeah. tell your public when you notice that you need to pull him back he has gone too far yeah and, and yeah. i think these are some of the things that come into play it, it, there's no easy answers and, yeah. and, and the young person now who turns who has turned to badness becomes what you call a sum of his experiences there's an mm -hmm. american author who would have wrote, written a book that, that is titled The Body Keeps Score. And uh, it, it talks about a sum of traumatic experiences that builds and determines a person's personality. And, uh, and I know, I know that this is quite true to the point where, where, where persons now find themselves in, in a bubble where they, instead of going up, they find themselves going down. And we know that is what the gang culture, that is what the negative influences in the society thrive on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, boy. True. That, wow. that sense of alienation. Yes. Very interesting. Well, at this time, we'd like to welcome those of us joining us online. We appreciate having you here with us today. Let's see what some of your thoughts and comments are. Mm. Uh, someone mm. by the name of Cleo in Rio Claro, Substance Abuse Prevention and Rehabilitation Haven says, this is a very important service. I encourage and endorse this, but drug abuse is skyrocketing and mm. drug facility is closing mm. its doors. Wow. Drug abuse add to social suicidal ideas. Suicidal. Suicidal ideas. Yes. All right. right. Ricardo Henry says, excellent topic. Uh, Ricia Borelli, she goes back to what uh, Leo was talking about earlier, instant gratification. Um, Ricardo again says, society frowns upon young men showing emotions. Um, Ricia again says, big boys don't cry. Uh, Zita Emanuel, People need to be taught that saying sorry does not 
equates to weakness. That is very true. Mm -hmm. And Rhesia says it's hard to be vulnerable, that it's almost seen as a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. um, Ricardo yeah, says but... societal norms and culture teaches our men to be disrespectful to women. You are not seen as a man if you don't run around and use women. Also, <laughs> when when we are taught that we not do not need to take responsibility and raise our children, that's the woman's role. Hence, the cycle continues. Very good points. Um, so, in terms of the first comment that was made, um, I just want to mention that you know, in terms of the the government making an effort to, to address some of these problems at the root that we have. What we have in place is a is a national drug policy that that defines and redefines a lot of the approaches that we have taken place. And and whilst we may some may hold the view that that, that rehabilitation and, and things to help others is going downhill, actually what might be happening another way of looking at it, and this is just a, suge a suggestion, is that that we need to redefine how we do things. Yeah. Because if we have had rehabilitation homes and programs in place for 30, 40 years ago uh, um, back, and when we evaluate these these services, we recognize that they haven't had the impact that we, that we would have liked them to have, then we need to do some restructuring. And I, believe that, yeah. I, I, I believe that our national drug policy, which is under the jurisdiction of NADAP, actually, and I'm mentioning it so um, people could actually go find the information themselves, educate themselves, um, and put yourselves in, you know, to see how we as a society, as mm -hmm. citizens as a whole, can play our parts to enable some of these tools that are being put before us so we can have the maximum impact. But notably, that we may be taken out of our comf comfort zones at times with these, mm -hmm. with these new, new things that we are trying to do to get different results. And we, 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 might, we, we will have to embrace a lot of change and yeah. do things differently. If we, want to, if we want to see different results and how many of yeah. us are really prepared to do so. Prepared for that. Correct. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. So very yeah. enlightening. So very yes. enlightening. This discussion is so enlightening. Thanks to everyone for your comments. Keep them coming. Um, let's move on to find out some ways in which we could deal with it. So um, it is true that men and boys are responsible for most of the violence we see in our society today. But why is this happening? Why is it that our boys and men are so violent? Let's listen to this perspective from Ben Boots. In his TED talk back in 2010, Tony Porter spoke about the idea of the collective socialization of men or what he calls the man box. The man box is this idea which sets out all of the expectations that we have about what boys and men should be. It has things like don't cry, be powerful, be dominant, be a protector, don't show any weakness, don't be like a woman. When we do this activity with boys, it's like something clicks for them and they realize that they've been tricked for their whole lives. They sometimes want to keep some of the things that are in the man box, and that's fine. Some things are not bad. Things like being athletic or strong or courageous, those things are fine. But they sometimes say that it feels like they're trapped in a prison and like it's a lot of pressure. We talk about where these ideas come from. We talk about things like movies and James Bond and how he never says no to sex unless he's trying to kill someone. We talk about... Um, Consent and how boys never feel like they have agency to actually give consent in any given situation. We talk about how we view women as the gatekeepers of sex. And we talk about why it's more appropriate to, to punch someone in the face than it is to cry when they embarrass you. We talk about films and TV and where all of these influences come from. And we talk about how if the boys had the choice, they probably wouldn't choose to be what society expects them to be. So how do we solve these issues? Well, based on my work, I would say what we need to do is have conversations, which sounds easier than it is sometimes. Mm. Wow, wow. Well, I feel that is what Speak Your Mind is attempting to do. Open the discussions, start conversations, and bring different ideas to the table for us to consider. And have the uncomfortable conversations. What do you think about yeah. that? <laughs> of more conversation and how possible is it in the real world? 
many of these conversations become very uncomfortable, uh, mostly because, as the speaker said, we realize that, wait a minute, maybe we were looking at this the wrong way. And we as human beings have this thing, we do not like to be wrong. We don't like to acknowledge that we've been wrong, especially if this is the way we've been doing things for so long. Go as far back as you can to the hunter-gatherer societies. Men are always told you have to be the provider, the protector, the hunter. So you must be strong. You must be athletic. You must be manly. To be anything else means certain death, not just for you, but for your family. And we've stuck to that for eons and generations. And now to go and see, well, maybe we can do it a little bit differently. Now, that is an uncomfortable statement. Mm -hmm. To say that, okay, it's okay to cry. It's okay to show emotion. It's, it's, it's okay to not want to attack somebody. That feels mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I drive the highway every day. Road rage is real. Mm -hmm. And the massive difference of somebody bad driving you just rolling down and saying sorry yeah i wasn't paying attention that changes everybody's mood everybody's mood what are some of the ways what are some of the ways of institutions are dealing with or youths with a, a pattern of violent behavior what is available for, for, for those now who want help maybe Shimani, you want to chime in here? I, I, I'd want to pass this one to Marvin because Marvin, he is he is definitely on the ground with this. Okay. All right. Well, um, Shimani put money spot. Um, <laughs> one of the things I notice that um, they do a lot is, is they put them in homes or they would take them to the courts and the courts would put them in homes. So like you would make mention earlier about the St. Michael's home. That is a place that would be opening back very soon. It's closed right now, but opening back very soon to take a lot of the at-risk youths. And the yeah. army would be running that institution. So the problem we're having is that everyone is frightened to deal with youths in the sense that the laws are the country. So a youth might be disrespectful, a youth might be violent. And in terms of how you deal with them, you're a bit frightened. Because sometimes they talk about this book. But then when they bring him in front of the court, the magistrate don't want to say, hey, we send you to jail. We're looking at rehabilitation. And the rehabilitation usually in the homes, and in the homes, it usually don't have any rehabilitation taking much play, taking place. <laughs> and that is the problem that we have in. Most people think you send the child to the home, and the home will get them better. And the reality is, the home not getting them better because they're meeting more youths just like them and they're bouncing up on one another and you're actually yes. having something worse. So the children going in bad and coming out worse. And then we have some who might be undecided and then they come out even with uh, Mr. Aganas, he would be able to vouch on taking place in the homes. And when you try different methods, sometimes it is not always accepted in terms of you might want to have a talk with them as we did in the school and, and show certain pictures of as young leaders dying or to, or how they look when they're bleeding on the ground and the homes will tell you no 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 that's not good for the children that will traumatize the children but right. at the end of the day if the children are heading down this road i think we need to have this difficult discussion with them and show them where it is leading them to because if we tell them hey you know you can dead what i mean that don't mean that I'm not going there, I go do it the right way. But when you show right. a young leader on the street, bloody, then we're now yeah. looking at weight. He's supposed to have all these soldiers and all these gangsters around him. And he did here all this money. And he did, then they might take a look and say, okay, let me take a step back. But when the homes is preventing you from doing this, it's very difficult to bring the reality to the children. So the children live, live in based on affection. We can do what we want and get away with it. And then when they reach out into society at age 18, either the police kill them, the friend kill them, or some wine person kill them. And this is the problem that we're having. What could be done is more mentorship. More mentorship. Right. Very good. good. You so Marvin, I, I, I would let me jump in at this point now, Marvin. Right. So just like last week, we have the two perspectives on how to proceed going forward. So as Marvin rightfully said, the glamorization of crime and and badness is one thing that fuels the youth in that direction 
taking away the glamour and showing them the the bitter end of it is the right. other thing that that um they need to see sometimes um the group that i work with these esteemed guys that are here on the panel today um we chose mentorship where we as individuals have presented ourselves as examples where we as individuals have presented ourselves yeah. saying listen badness is not the only option you can achieve what you need to achieve legitimately through life and live life enjoying it you can have your entire life in front of you but the thing about it is that mentorship needs to be deliberate mm -hmm. and and that is the, the problem that we're going to have going forward and i say deliberate in the sense that as leo would have said we as individuals need to see our weaknesses when they become apparent we make mistakes we make mistakes we are human we will make mistakes but we need to be adult enough to say i have made a mistake this wasn't the best option a better option is this direction mm. and we need to be deliberate in doing that constantly doing that because we're in a society where bad examples are easy to come by yeah easy for the good so ones too yeah, we need to we need to look for more mentors for these young people i remember father harvey did a program for a while where he went into communities and did big concerts with different singers and was mentoring mm -hmm. youths and i thought that was a really good good program that he was doing maybe we need to do some more things I, like that yeah so, I, am, I am i am i am here in all of us and i just want to make a quick comment comment where this is concerned in that and this is what continues to happen and have us where we are today in that there's a lot of us who have good intentions there's a lot yeah. of us who are, are get up and you know recognize that we have a problem and you know in our own spaces of influence we try to, to to do the best that we can do and you know we're fighting a problem that is way bigger than us and this is where we need to have cohesion within our society and i say cohesion in that those interested in mentorship, those interested in running a youth program, those interested in role modeling need to come together as a society. Because if we're going to continue tackling these problems in silos, we will have siloed response, um, um, results as well. And, yeah. and in order to do so, coming under one platform, this is in responding directly to Vonnet's question. There are a lot of institutions that has came up the establishment um, of the Children's Authority, the, 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 Chen, the Child and Gender Affairs Unit of the Office of the Prime Minister, and all the other NGOs like um, Child, Line, for, Child Line, for example, that has that has that came up over the years in response to our societal problems um, in addressing and developing our youths in a healthy that, way. You know, yeah. corporate, private, public partnerships, for example. Um, sure. Those are things that, that we need to see a little more cohesion in, in that so that when we operate, so we as mentors, we operate in under the framework and we align ourselves with the work of what the society as a whole is trying to accomplish because we're doing it under the guidance of one national guideline. So one policy. national guideline. I think yeah, that's we just, wonderful. We just, because we have a lot of good people with good intentions doing mm -hmm. a lot of good things. But if we bring it together, I believe we can have a more powerful impact. Anthony, you are dealing right into our next segment, which we'll speed through because you have answered so many and so much of it already. Finding help. So guys, what, are, what, what maybe you could tell me, Marvin, what, what is something that's being done to kind of um, get our boys before it's a little too late and set, not waiting for them to reach you? What is happening? Mm. Do you have anything well, happening before? Well, I'll take extreme pleasure in saying the mentorship group that me and my colleagues here are we going to schools and we're facing it head on and we're taking them at a young age and showing them that hey, we don't have to have fun this way. We can have it this way. We don't want to be successful this way. We have it this way. In terms of, you don't want to be a gangster to be successful in life. You can be a nurse. I have a reason why my hair is being plats. And I used to show you that you don't want to see a nurse as a particular person yeah. or a feminine like person. Oh. Look at me. I look at just like you. I wear the same clothes or let us wear the same Timberlands, the same fashion, the same music. However, I'm a registered nurse. I'm not out there shooting nobody. I'm not out there robbing nobody. I drive in the same vehicles. I live in the same place as the gang leaders. And I'm doing it the proper way. And this is what we do it might be in mentors. We're showing them that you don't have to look at success 
being lame or being boring. You can be successful in your own way, in your own fashion, in your own style, and you don't have to do it illegal. You can do it Excellent. in the legal way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting point. Well, the Another good thing that, that, that is happening <laughs> that I've, I've seen firsthand, and one of the reasons why I got with the mentorship group is they are giving use of voice. Mm -hmm. Not having a safe feeling powerless. We've already established that these are some of the, the, the root causes that lead them down this path, that sense of belonging, that sense of I want to be in control of something. And within the mentorship program, getting their point of view, letting them have a say, letting them come and discuss things, giving them that forum to be able to not only express themselves without ridicule, but mm -hmm. to make mistakes and know, hey, we, we make mistakes too. A mistake is fine. Here's what we do next. Mm -hmm. right. That goes right. a long way as well. Right. Well, I believe that I be, I believe that um very quickly that um we as a society as we come together to do all to do what we have to do that if once we're doing it from a place of a good heart giving the opportunity to the youths and them to express themselves to come forward um that we're going to have the impact that we want to have you know youths want to be in a place where they feel welcome they want to they want to talk to people who they know will listen to them without judging them Mm -hmm. uh, and if we give them that space to do so, I think we're going to reach a lot more, a lot more of them, a lot more of, of them. Course, I want to, because... I want to take this note to just, to just encourage us that there's a lot of, uh, any of us could show support to young persons within our spheres. And if right. we recognize that they're having problems, that is bigger right. than us. And the support that we could give, refer them to the, there's a lot of professional um, bodies, government agencies, NGOs that offer help um, directly. Um, and I could just point you straight to find here, TT, and now there's a child support services um, page there. You go, you find um, all the different services that you could depend on what you may need uh, for parents and children alike, where you could find a lot of safe spaces to get professional help as well. Yeah, because this problem of violence in society seems to be so critical. And I'm so glad to hear that you all are going into our schools and, and talking weekly with our young people. Uh, maybe we need to add that more into the curriculum. Because mm -hmm. you all have taught me so many things here that I wish I learned in school mm -hmm. about psychology, about parenting, you know. So our youths need to be seen and heard and be given hope for their future. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful discussion and a fabulous panel. I like you all so much. I mean, and the time flies. Yeah, yes. so much as we want to say, and the time just just keeps going. So um, yes. um I, I think we have to wrap up. So I don't know if you all have any parting words before we close. Leo, maybe you. <laughs> mm. Sorry. Tell us a little bit about me. hope. A little bit about the hope, Leo. Hope for the future. We have to leave in a minute there. There is always hope for the future. We always say that our our children are the future. And mm. in order for us to have a future, we need to build through them. And as Marvin rightly says, showing them the correct path, showing them that it can be done the proper way. <laughs> Immediate gratification is not the way, you know, taking the time, doing it properly, making something in yourself without having to harm others in the process, mm -hmm. we can go far. Yes, of course. The, the example is the first step in doing that. Leo, Anthony, Sherman, thank you, and Marvin. It was indeed our pleasure being with you here today, yes. having you. It was enlightening. Thank you very much for your time and thoughts. Yes, and... Okay. Yes, thank you very much for having us here this afternoon. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. for us to share. Great. Always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Always it a was pleasure. nice being here once again. Yes. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. And I would also like to thank those of us joining us online and who took part in today's show. Join us next week, same time and same place. I'm Dean Bisundial. Have a great week, everyone. Guys, I'm Vaughn and Bigfoot. I wish you all a wonderful Valentine. If I was close to each of you, you'd get a lot of chocolate. <laughs> it was so wonderful. I love you all. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Yes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And Vonnet and Dean, I'm Cecilia Salazar. And as we always say at OMG, let's be, let's let's be, be kind, kind to each, each other. Each other. Each other. Each other. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 <laughs>